Hello and welcome. It's July 29th, 2023, and we're here in session three discussion of the course Physics is Information Processing at the Active Inference Institute. We're having a follow-up discussion on Chris Fields' third lecture on quantum reference frames, and we're looking forward to your participation. So if you're watching along live and You've been invited to the calendar event. It's not too late to jump in. If you're watching on YouTube, you can write any questions or comments in the live chat with Dean and Andrew here. We're going to be looking at some of the key points and taking it in a few different directions, sharing our reference frames, making a shared one. So Andrew, it'd be awesome to have you zoom in a little bit on the slide. And then feel free to, to take us through some of the key points so that we can um, see a little bit how you're seeing it. Thank you. That looks good. Yep. Okay, so let's let's start by reviewing um, the last lecture from a couple of weeks ago, and then we can open up the discussions. If there's any questions that appear in the live chat, we can address those. Uh, all right. So. In lecture two, Chris introduced this idea of uh, the, the information processing between system A and B, you know, where they interact via qubits on a boundary and they have um, reference frames that give meaning to this, com to this communication. You, you want to think of uh, information processing as a communication channel, uh, the way uh, Shannon thought about it. Uh, so that was in lecture two. And lecture three, a couple weeks ago, uh, tried to make this more explicit by emphasizing the idea that this has to be physically embodied somewhere. OK? And I, I think that because we are so used to information being fungible, uh, in no small part because of the internet and everything, uh, it's it's a little hard uh, to understand at first when the claim is made that <clears throat> you have a QRF that it's non-fungible or you have a piece of quantum information that's non-fungible or things like the no cloning theorem. We're, we're so used to information being fungible to it being zeros and ones that it, it's a bit of a change in, in, in mindset at first, but that's exactly what lecture three um, introduced. This was all old stuff, right? Um, could, could could you maybe just unpack that a little bit? What would it mean for information to be fungible, or what's that stance like? And then what does it mean for information to be non-fungible, and what is that stance like? Yeah, I'm I'm about to get there. Uh, so let me let me scroll down the slides because um, that's addressed here. So I was maybe I should have kept this uh, in the beginning, but anyways, session two talked about how information theory makes this simple and obvious, OK? And in, se in uh, session three, we talk about reference frames and mechanistically how all of this works. Um, so yeah, let's address that question of the difference between, between, hold on one second. Let me use my mouse to scroll down here. OK, so that's that's a little faster, right? Let's okay, get... so um, can you restate your question, uh, Dana? Yeah, what would it mean for information to be fungible or non-fungible? People might be familiar with that in the economic setting with non-fungible tokens and all of that, but what are we talking about with informational fungibility? I, I think it basically comes down to, um, to whether you can replicate. I mean, it's basically the difference between classical and quantum information, as far as I know. Uh, uh, fungible information is everything that you can basically turn into a message of zeros and ones. Uh, it, it's, you know, how you transmit it may be different, you know, the channel, the physical hardware, and so on. But, but at the end of the day, it's something that you can write on a boundary and something that you can transmit as zeros and ones. Whereas quantum information, uh, you literally have to send the hardware, the piece of hardware, uh, the QRF. At least that's how I understand it. So a simple answer might be um, 
that it's information encoded in a piece of software versus a piece of hardware, but I, I don't I don't think that analogy is, is perfect. But what do you Yeah, Dean, what yeah. do you think? Oh, here's what I'm curious about. And again, you guys can help me with this. As opposed to reference frames, I oftentimes default to frame of reference. And I know that in one of the live streams, what I tried to bring out was the idea that there was an ice cream cone looking at an ice cream truck. And the question was always whether or not which which one of those two entities is it? one is in the foreground and one is in the background. And in this slide that Ander has up, the question is, is the non-fungibility because only A and B can decide whether the A, the VA as seen by B, the A is deeper into that image based on our frame of reference and the B is closer or is the B the one that's actually deeper and the A is the one that's in the foreground. And I was wondering whether the idea of non-copyability is because of that depth of field aspect that cannot be determined unless it's literally handed over the way that Chris was describing it. I think I think that's basically accurate. I think um I'm not sure that I can answer the question, but I think I have the feeling that Chris, well, Chris said this in the lecture that, I mean, at the end of the day, the KRF is somewhere in your in your nervous system. Right. Uh, and uh, here, whether, I mean, it, you bring up a good point, right? It, it looks like this slide is a bit of a an optical illusion. Whether you see A or B deeper, uh, <laughs> I guess it depends on something going on inside your head. Um, if you, this picture is so symmetrical that if you focus enough on it, you can change your opinion. Um, well, well, but just to even connect that to what we're talking about, the classical fungible information on the holographic screen, on the blanket, and yeah. then so the me, quantum yeah. cognitive rotation is those two images are on the screen identical and then whether it gets a quantum rotation such that the uh, three points of the axes are closer to us than the intersection on that kind of tetrahedron or the other way around, whether the ballerina is rotating one way or the other, that's not on the boundary. So the information about the depth of field is part of the QRF or part of the enactment of the QRF, and it's not written on the boundary. And that goes back to the preparation question and not just the measuring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like if the preparation, if your whole enculturation or the last five minutes, it was uh, entrained or you were holding an object that predisposed you to think that the vertex of the intersection was further away, mm -hmm. that's the preparation that your, sets your prior so that when you get this ambiguous artifact, you rotate it into the most natural position cognitively mm -hmm. and that's the preparation that sets you up for a measurement no measurement can happen without a preparation what do you think andrew uh sure yeah yeah everything you said makes sense um so uh perhaps let me uh let me recall what was that around the slides uh there was a in, in this whole spirit or philosophy of making Emphasizing that information is physical, you know, it con concubit this whole thing. Um, one of the uh, glaring omissions in, in physics was uh, the embodiment of the reference frame, which was treated as an abstraction, uh, you know, in classical physics, such as by Galileo. But maybe even Einstein, even if he, uh, my hunch is that he did have more of this instinct of. You know, particularly in all those thought experiments of trying to chase the light, light ray, you are chasing the light ray, right? So at the end of the day, um, but I mean, this this is a whole process of making the observer and the reference frame more and more explicit and more and more physical, because at the end of the day, it has to, right? If if you start with this assumption that um, solipsistic assumption, almost that you know, all, all you see and and you know, 
is, is part of the same material uh, ether that you are, <laughs> then, you know, then you are part of the universe that, and, and you're observing something that is out there. Uh, so you, you need to make, include a theory of, of what it means for you to be observing that, right? And at the end of the day, the observer has to be physical. That's what was emphasized by, by Chris at the beginning of this lecture. So this jump from treating the reference frame as an abstraction to a real physical entity. And yeah, these, these are, these, these people have uh, talked a lot about uh, in these papers that are quoted there, but I should also remark uh, if folks want to see this, it's it's coming up in high energy theory also in recent work of um, in recent work of Saskin and, and others where they talk about quantum reference frames uh, very explicitly. So I don't I don't have the citations off the bat, but it's definitely becoming an, an important thing in the last twenty years. This attempt to really explicitly treat the reference frame and the observer as a quantum entity, uh, as a physical entity. Okay, so this, this is what I just said. Okay, the jump from treating things, reference frames, as abstractions to physical objects. Go. And, and because we cannot make a perfect copy of quantum information, we say that these are unique and clonable and unfungible. Um, so, in order to recreate an experiment perfectly, uh, this is the this is addresses the part of fungibility or not, right? Can can Alice, if you have some sort of quantum experiment and, and Alice and Bob are, you know, it's the usual EPR uh, thought experiment or whatever, Alice and Bob are separated by light years. Is it enough if they want to recreate the same exact the same ex experiment for Alice to send? string of zeros and ones. Well, if, if you had an experiment where that's enough, then, then you can recreate it with fungible information. If not, then you need to somehow send non-fungible information, which really implies sending a piece of hardware. Um, can, I, can I add another, uh, another piece here Look, on the previous uh, slide? Uh -huh. So this looks really technical and scientific but let's think about alice's laboratory is alice's brain mind and bob's analogously alice is thinking about what to say and then says it and that information might be written in a chat form it might be said verbally it might be transmitted through a digital or analog signal um, but at some point, it's going through this classical informational interface. And then Bob's laboratory is like perceiving and unpacking it. And the question of semantic alignment is such that if Alice gives a shopping list of 10 items, if there's semantic alignment, Bob would be able to go to the store and then find those 10 items. And it made me think of the, the dictionary definition of left and right. So this gets back to our discussion of whether the vertex on these axes is coming towards us or away from us. So I looked up the, de the dictionary definition of left. On, towards, or relating to the side of a human body or of a thing that is to the west when the person or that thing is facing north. So that's, <laughs> I guess, one attempt to anchor what it means to be left. The second definition is the left-hand part, side, or direction. And you could imagine there's an analogous definition for right. The point is, you can't describe verbally leftness and rightness or chirality in general because its referent is an embodied perspective. And so if Alice said, okay, you're going to go down the street and then turn left at the stop sign, how would Alice communicate to Bob what leftness meant at that stop sign versus rightness? And, and that's this question of flipping and the way that the quantum formalism accommodates that is through the wick rotation and the quantum cognitive events where the fungible transmittable holographic information 
gets rotated into the imaginary axis with the formalisms that enable it to be rotated at all, but that means you could rotate it left, quote, or rotate it right. Yeah, I think that's that's a very good explanation. I don't know if I have much to add. Dean, do you wanted to say something? What I, so, but I can't, I don't know the answer to this, but to take what Daniel just said, to take the basic concept of being able to take something that for all intents and purposes can appear one way or another and then turn that into how chris closed the last lecture with we are we are seeing ourselves as both being entangled and also being separatable how did we go literally from a th a three dimension vertex to we're both entangled and we're we're not living in a paradox that's just the way it is we're also removing ourselves or separating ourselves at the same time that's what i would like to know because <laughs> somewhere between three arbitrary lines and complexity is not a paradox something has to be ha happening and i'm not exactly sure how that transition plays out Anybody want to enlighten me? <laughs> you, can you repeat your question, please? Well, how do we how do we go like from the, at this point of the reference frame description of saying it can't you you can't copy it? All you can do is pass it. Mm -hmm. how, because we think things could be flipped based on internal internal reference frames, internal meanings, and internal models. The, the the thing we choose for context, yada yada yada, goes all the way out to the conclusion of and uh, of Chris's um, conversation with us in in, the, in number three, where he said, "Bottom line is is that it's not a paradox that as things become more and more complex, then it it wants to be able it 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 wants to get to a place of entanglement alignment." a sense of agreement and at the same time wants to remain separate so between those two things a whole lot has happened but and i don't think we've skipped over it but we certainly haven't opened it up and really looked at it closely and i'm just curious what's in between those two scales i i agree i think we're we're gonna cover that towards the end of the of the talk um but I, I agree. I, I, I don't know how you see this related to QRS uh, or the stuff we just talked about. But but I think it's the big question in this in this lecture, right? That was like where does this tension between increasing complexity and you know wanting wanting to predict what the environment is doing? One, one requires entanglement, and the other one requires separability. At least colloquially speaking, I, I think this tension is um basically what the free energy principle comes down to right daniel what do you think you have the free energy and you have the e minus ts and one is prediction error i mean not exactly e minus ts right that would be in thermodynamics but you know what i mean one is prediction error and the other one is what was it can't remember I'll definitely look forward to to the the technical unpacking that that you'll get to soon. But but I was reminded of the William Blake quotation: "Do what you will. This life's a fiction and is made up of contradiction." So let's modify that. Um, project what you will, rotate what you will. Space times a fiction, not that it's false, but that it's a projected fictionalization that it doesn't have the ontological primacy that the topology of communication does and is made up of contradiction. Yes, and it's made up of this tension between fitting and not overfitting, between aligning and the principle of unitarity and yeah. differentiating and becoming through others we become ourselves and that type of articulation. 
and uh, recognizing that two complementary forces like convex and concave come into existence at once, like a zero to two jump, is not an issue or, or a stumbling block. It's that we wouldn't have it any other way. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have it any other way. Yeah. Uh, sure, we'll, we'll get that towards the end. Uh, you can almost even call it a duality. It's not uh, far-fetched. I mean, it's it's the sort of thing that I think most people will be happy to take for granted, such, you know, supersymmetry. Like, you have two kinds of particles, but the same amount of them, and, you know, dualities are all over the place. So I, I think I think it's fairly... It's, it's not unreasonable to just accept that there are there is a tension between uh, increasing complexity, which you want you want a and b to be separable for, and accuracy of prediction. Now, how this is related to um, uh, emergent space and uh, and these QRFs stuff, you know, I, I don't want to make very far fetched claims. We'll talk about emergent space later in the course. Uh, but but for now let's 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 say a few more words about QRFs and then we'll get to the you know complexity stuff towards the end. Um, so so QRFs are almost uh, building blocks if you want for uh, information processing. Uh, here it's very uh, useful to recall the definition that I feel I think we we have mentioned before of information as being differences that make a difference. That's probably the best colloquial uh, definition of information I've, I've heard. And I think I think it does a lot of work. I mean, it's almost mathematical. But anyways, we need to unpack it a little more and, and see. So for a difference to make a difference, what do you want out of QRF, right? And surprisingly, I mean, not surprisingly, but reassuringly, I think would be the word. Uh, you need a QRF to have sensory action and a default state, right? This is sort of like uh, where your Bayesian prior distribution is encoded. These three things will give you a building block for any information processing. And that, you know, uh, ties together with all the work in the free energy literature and perception, action, loops, and, and, and whatnot. Um, so before we see mathematically how a QRF is defined, uh, I think it's more illustrative. And I think Chris went exactly on the right order when, when he presented this a couple of weeks ago, seeing uh, examples from nature. These are actual pieces of forward that are effectively QRFs. And it's it's remarkable how they map to, well, I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit, but when, when you get to the, to the mathematical definition of a QRF as a quantum system that, um, you know, you can specify with, with this category theory diagram, you know, you have incoming arrows into a node that then it expands, right? And this roughly corresponds to measurement and preparation degrees of, not degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom would be the same. Right when you attach it to the boundary, but measurement and preparation stages, I guess, would be the the better word. Uh, but but any, anyways, let me go back to to these examples, right? Um, and Daniel, you're the biologist here, so correct me if I say anything wrong here. You have a, a cartoon picture of a bacteria, I think, and this is a very simple sort of thing, right? It navigates in in the direction of food. And and that's it, right? <laughs> so it, it is a very simple rudimentary example of a QRF. You have the sensory uh, uh, stage here, I guess, the degrees of freedom. I guess the degrees of freedom, um, it's not obvious here what the boundary is. That's one thing. Uh, but uh, it is a good enough picture to see the resemblance to here. We have the measurement. Which in this in this case you're trying to measure concentration of food. You have your node here, C, which is your prior distribution for concentration of food, and finally you have the output, the preparation stage, 
which is your, you know, this the rest of this chemical network that will control uh, and steer this bacterium, right? So there's here, you want to call it the action degrees of freedom um, that will steer this bacteria in the direction of food. And likewise with uh, cell division, this I understand even less. Uh, the network appears more complicated, uh, but I think it's fair to say that at the end of the day, all these chemical networks that appear super complicated somehow have to be mapped to this category theoretical diagram. That's 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 all there is to it. You're going to have the sensory input and the action output, and you're going to have the the default chemical concentration, which amounts to this to this node over here. Oh, you, remember of... this, you remember this from last lecture, right, Daniel? Yeah, and, and the cone co cone we explored also in in live stream seventeen on the Bayesian semantic information flow. But I'll kind of add a point about these biological systems. Yes, please. Um, in relationship to, to artificially specified systems and what that helps us understand about perception, cognition, action. So the cone co cone diagram has this bow tie architecture or this kind of like two pyramids touching point to point where there's a um, preparation and a measurement which can be um, different dimensionalities or, or, or different scopes like it could be multi-input, multi-output, or multi-input, single output, vice versa, and so on. But they come through this eye of the needle with C prime here. Now contrast that kind of architecture um, represented here abstractly with what we see in the bacterial process and in the cell division process. These have that kind of a bow tie perception, cognition, action, architecture, or measurement, cognitive integration, preparation, architecture. In contrast, we see, for example, an artificial neural network where the input and the output layers are usually lower dimensional, maybe uh, an, an image coming in with several hundred pixels and a single output, like a classifier coming out the other end, but a dimensional explosion in those internal cognitive layers. But in biological systems, it's actually exactly the opposite. For example, many, many, many receptors on the cell surface, on the holographic boundary, the sensorium of the cell, but then there are these common secondary messengers that many pathways converge upon. So that reflects the kind of radically different architecture that a QRF embodies as opposed to the approach taken by disembodied intelligence frameworks, which use dimensional explosion internally to try to categorize and classify and find, find edge cases versus this dimensional winnowing that is reflective of these embodied intelligences. Mm -hmm. And if I may uh, make a tangential comment here also, no, I, I think the good thing about these two examples is that they also showcase the fact of how, how you know, the, the deep implications of scale-free biology, if you want to call it this way, we tend to think of uh, these sorts of processes, right, of such as here, uh, only happening at the level of the nervous system in animals. Uh, or as you said, neural networks, right? We tend to associate this with neural networks. And and perhaps evolution has tiered us in a way that's um, endowed us with nervous systems to make these things, maybe these are higher up in the in the in the layers. Uh, but really there is, you know, that's a bit of an arbitrary distinction that we make. You know, the, the processes going on at the cellular level, even if they don't appear to have anything to do with the nervous system, my understanding is that uh, they are there are there are some ge generic properties that are the same and everything that has to do with information processing you know it manifests maybe slightly different uh when it comes to explicit nerves but at the end of the day it's the same generic process going on would you would you say that's right daniel 
the the ontological claim is that it's the same generic process happening whereas the more instrumentalist claim is that we can model it with some shared abstractions mm -hmm. yeah okay so we can we can continue right um so uh from you know i i don't have a whole lot to say daniel uh, said quite a bit about at the end of the day curve is is you can visualize it as this diagram and you know you can think of it as uh, if, if you are more familiar with the picture of a neural network and ways on a neural network and so on that's the way to think about it now let's continue with explicit embodiment if you wish uh so curves in in the formalism have to be attached to uh a boundary boundary degrees of freedom and i should add another remark here i think and personally to me also like the, the hard part about uh this quantum free energy principle formalism if you wish is is what you said at the beginning is the fact that it's topological right so so very often it's not clear what the boundary degrees of freedom are right because we tend to think of boundaries as you know geometrical and, and certainly the classical fep treats them as geometrical uh but that's not the case here in the quantum free energy uh, formalism and where we have emergent space as will be talked about in later sessions but that's just like one one quick remark to make at the end of the day though even if it's topological we're going to have real degrees of freedom that um this urf is attaching to this cone cocoon diagram and you're going to have measurement operators that yield um classical outcomes um, plus and minus one and uh and then you can think of this qrf um or more abstractly this cone cocoon diagram as as a neural network if you wish uh acting on those under qubits and then back propagating uh some sort of action signal preparation um okay then let's not forget that uh landauer's principle and so on uh requires that we are mindful of energy constraints on computation uh, and that gives us the following picture uh number one we're gonna have to use energy uh, from the environment to fuel our computation to fuel our observation so that means that right away you cannot use the entirety of your boundary to gather information your there's it necessitates a uh, an allocation of resources right uh, here e is the observed environment and the blue portion is a thermodynamical sector where you extract free energy and and, and, and dump heat in order to run this computational process and then furthermore you can have uh a memory sector where you write things on the boundary okay? and this takes up energy also right writing information on onto the boundary by landauer's principle will take up information and uh chris called this the minimal interest in observer because it has a memory sector and why minimal here uh implies that we have at least a minimal interesting implies that we have more than one layer here the process of writing things into the into a memory sector requires us to have a clock so that we can label those memories um, in time okay so we do have time as part of this formalism just not space yet okay the time has to be internal to the observer just just one piece on that 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 chris mentioned um as and as you echoed time here is an attribute of some cognitive systems in terms of their internal understanding so that they can sort memories and understand what came earlier or later it's not something that's a priori defined externally 
which is the case in the kind of space time first. Now, how do we fit communication into here? We flip that. We're talking about the topology of communication as ontologically primal. And now certain kinds of sophisticated agents, this is not like necessarily true of a rock or a metronome or a particle of a gas, but some kinds of cognitive systems are such that they are able to generate an internal clock concept. And that doesn't have to be the same thing as what's happening on the wall with Kronos. This can reflect a purely internal time, Kairos, that enables observers or interactors that have different clock structures. And then Landauer's principle helps us arbitrage or connect the informational demands to the energetic or the metabolic demands. Dean? So when I, when I first listened to the lecture, I thought when the when the term or phrase trade off was raised, I I traditionally have thought of trade off as kind of a binary. If I'm picking this, I'm trading off against all the other things that I didn't pick. So one or or the other or others plural. But when I saw when I saw this, and especially when I heard it in the context of things like degrees of freedom, I began to wonder whether it is, because it could sit on either side of that boundary, it could be a priori, or it could be ad hoc or post hoc, a trade-off, which I, prior to this conversation, I just assumed that a trade-off was one or the other, but essentially what this implies is it it isn't even it's still a kind of a degree of of how much weight you put into it and then it you kind of cross a threshold and then you've made your pick you've you've completed your trade off or did i again did i misinterpret what i was hearing if it's if it's topological as opposed to the the more conventional space time perspective is this can can a trade off be both ad hoc and post hoc, seemingly at the same time? Very interesting question. Let us just let it float and continue on. Enter. Okay. All right, because maybe because again, if it's if it, I'll just say this: if it if it can be, that that would really move us out of the classical realm that would essentially say that anytime we've made a pick we re we really haven't made a pick there's still a whole bunch of other things that are going to happen that can that can change whatever that action is that we thought we carried out or enacted if we're talking about in, in an intern intern internality state which is what I think we want. I think we want to be able to change our minds. Let me take that one way, Dean. Um, the, the analytical equations of the action perception loop don't tell us in implementation, like if we're going to write it in code, whether we should use action first procedurally to update our observations right. or whether we enable our observations to to wag the dog and then select action at the end of the loop so is it a perception action loop or is it an action perception loop exactly. and those enable a kind of um seesaw where sometimes we want what we learn to change what we do and other times we want what we do to change what we learn and having that kind of a fulcrum or a pivot. And then again, to connect it to the vertex popping in and out, the analytical formalisms inscribed on the screen of the FEP, like the textbooks, they're ambiguous whether we lead with action and have inference follow or whether we lead with inference and, and have action follow 
or or <laughs> lead with action have inference follow whichever one of the combinations there are um because we st and then the that um trade off or runoff is broken by specific embodied cognitive agents that that trade off about the um the procedural primacy of per perception or action can't be broken generically right Mm -hmm. It certainly makes for a lot of waste heat if you're not careful. It'd be exhausting a lot. Anyway. Okay. So, um, so I, I see. I, I don't know if we can um, talk about intent uh, much with this formalism. But we can take a very descriptive uh, approach to it and uh, go down here a little more. Uh, actually, before I don't want to get up ahead of myself. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, whether we can put intent or not in this hierarchy, um, I, I don't know. I don't know if it matters a whole lot, but at least we can talk about it you know, operationally and, and descriptively. And, and say, just like when you have a clock, uh, you know, that the clock is just there, right? Like it, it is, it, it, if you don't have the clock, you don't have the memory and that's it, right? Uh, and likewise here, if we don't have attention, uh, an attention control compartment, we just cannot have, we cannot play with all these QRFs uh, that are non-commutative at the same time. So, if there is no attention control system to begin with, no, we don't. We cannot talk about a system that has non-commutative QRFs. Meaning, here one one presumably goes to memory sectors, the other one goes to environment sectors, and, and so on. Uh, so, so this is certainly a necessity of the fact that we have um, different sectors of the boundary being allocated to different purposes, such as environmental observation and memory and so on um, within the environment it was it's it's worth remarking that here if you if you think deeply about first principles and what it means to observe an, an entity um, well you still come down to these differences that make a difference sort of thing right which involves whenever you're looking at the environment, to if you're going to identify a system you need sort of a background that tells you that puts the, the system in, in context right so that you can identify the system as some, something distinct i think this again is something that we have talked about in previous uh discussions where the easiest picture here is something like the gauge speed gauge in your car where the P is, is the gauge itself that it tells you the speed, but it's meaningless without the reference system, right? Outside of outside of the thing that stays invariant, right? The context, the background, um, that gauge moving means nothing to you. Okay, so we come on, come back to this idea of if we think of information as differences that make a difference in terms of first principles. This environment sector that we saw earlier has to be further broken down into pointer and reference states. Again, this is covered uh, in depth in the in Chris's papers. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of uh, free energy for generic quantum systems. Uh, and again, uh, just to reiterate, this attention control stuff uh, compartment. Uh, which is, by the way, very reminiscent to to the hierarchy that was earlier with the clock uh, arising higher up in the hierarchy, deeper <laughs> into the layer. Um, likewise, whenever we have so, whenever you're writing something into into a memory, you need you need to have that clock. Whenever you are deploying non community QRFs, you're you're going to need uh, attention an attention control compartment, and we just described this op operationally. Um, if you didn't have it, then the agent would not be what it is. It could not deploy those non-commutative QRFs. Uh, 
Uh, so marching on, uh, we'll just end here with uh, theoretical alignment and, and the free energy principle. Just a few more words. Uh, this is possibly the most interesting picture in this in this uh, presentation. And just we can recall here uh, the possibilities for QRF alignment and how free energy comes into play in this in this um, formalism. So is that we call we call a the trivial interaction. We call this a thermal interaction, and and then you have a bunch of possibilities, right? And, and depending on each possibility, you're, you're going to see things as uh, noise or, as in the paper says, uh, non-local hidden variables. Uh, the last situation is uh, what we call alignment, when we have QRFs of the same size perfectly aligned. Okay. So I can't quite recall, I think this. This would be the situation where you have uh, noiseless classical uh, computation, right? You just have A and B just interacting, you know. And uh, it also, also, this is the situation where, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, this is, this is entanglements, right? Asymptotically, once all the curves are aligned, you, you have entanglement. And now we can tie back maybe to Gein's earlier. So these two these two slides conclude the, the discussion basically, and then we can open it up. Um, so given these possibilities for how QRFs can be aligned, QRFs deployed by AMD can be aligned, uh, and how you know in, the, in, in each situation you're going to get noise or or whatever. Um, then what does the free energy principle say in this quantum setting? Well, minimizing variational free energy leads you to entanglements. Okay. So if here I'm here, if you are in the picture of me here, and the QRFs are are aligned, uh, A and B are going to be entangled. Now, there is a tension between this tendency towards alignment, uh, as the free energy principle uh, will carry you, and uh, observe reality, which is that we're not just a blob of entangled particles. So there is separability, and systems uh, are at tension between maintaining separability um, and at the same time being correlated enough to the environment so as to be able to predict predict it. Okay. And now we can maybe go into a more philosophical discussion about the free energy principle. Um, I should also say in the last month I just like I talked earlier at QRFs, um Lenny Saskin, whose recent paper that talks about QRF, it led me into a rabbit hole of looking into his recent work and He's talked a lot about complexity. Uh, I'm being very speculative here, so I, if someone can call me out, uh, that would be good in the comments. But just to skim it through some of his papers, I saw a, a monograph in 2018 where he talks about complexity. And, you know, he puts forward the second law for complexity in quantum systems and increased complexity. And, it is very reminiscent of what's going on here. You have a tension between uh, systems tending to entanglement and the other side of the free energy functional, if you wish, where systems um, increase in complexity. And that necessarily requires uh, that A and B are separate. So Daniel, do you have any comments at this point? Yeah, there's a lot to it. I, I like that you showed the four possibilities uh, in the image above and, and said it was a, one of the most interesting figures. I, I agree. And uh, how to connect this to the classical FEP, 
and also how to see the quantum FEP not as just uh, a second story built on top of the classical FEP, which would be kind of like a, a historical, chronological understanding of the theoretical apparatus, but it's almost like the quantum FEP was like a basement we didn't know about because it it gives a broader context and though it appeared conceptually several years later in the timeline we understand that doesn't give it a secondary um status so what it really means for the classical fep to be kind of like a special case of this um actually more generic setting there's just a lot i'm very yeah uncertain maybe about. i can i can i i can wrap it up uh and then if dean or you want to say something um we can continue with that but let me conclude and this is all i have to say for today um i i think i mean i'm sure chris will explain this more in, in coming uh, sessions and, and lectures but i think the main key difference is, is in is in the emergence of of space how it might emerge from something more fundamental maybe a tensor network or who knows uh but that's that's the big big difference right and and, and i suppose the quantum free energy principle generalizes the classical free energy principle because it doesn't have this spatial embedding now uh this, uh, to me personally, and 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 also to folks in the audience who are asking questions, is is probably the hardest part to wrap your head around. And and I, I, I foresee interest in in those uh, discussions and lectures that uh, deal with the concept of emergent space, because every time you try to, and I've done it, I've done this myself. I've been thinking about how you could apply this formalism to better known pictures or, or compared it, for instance, with thermal equilibrium, with relaxation, with thermal equilibrium. And then you start thinking about, okay, what is the boundary and so on? It's far from obvious, right? Because again, you have to remind yourself that the definition is topological. So in that regard, I think it might be worth um, talking about one of the questions that came up that I thought I thought was good. And, and then I can call it a day on this end. Um, so this question, and I think it was the first question asked since the last lecture. Can you just read uh, the full question yes, and then read the full answer? I'll Thank you. The, the question and the answer, it's number 28 here. Can you guys see it? Should I zoom in a little bit? It's it's pretty small, but but reading it will be good. Okay, so this question, I think, I, I've asked myself this question too, um, maybe with different, in a different way, but basically, it, you know, it gets to the point of what I was saying earlier, right? Um, that it, it would be nice to see how we can use this quantum free energy principle formalism to recover maybe familiar settings such as relaxation to thermal equilibrium via the heat equation, but that's far from always how you do it if your definition is topological, right? So the question says, what happens when the agent becomes identical to the environment? Uh, when the model has been improved so much that it does not differ from the environment is this a state even possible would it be thermodynamical equilibrium maximum entanglement okay so clearly it's not thermodynamical equilibrium but i think what the person is asking if i maybe if i'm understanding this correctly they're wondering okay so if the free energy principle drives a and b towards entanglement then is it fair to say that they have that any distinction between them has dissolved Right, that they have merged into the same thing. Um, and that has to do with this whole definition of philosophical debate of thingness that uh, Carl Priston you know, is a proponent of, right? Uh, what, what it means for two things to be separate. Okay. So let's see what Chris said. Uh, Priston has pointed out that the limit of the classical FEP, the limit of perfect prediction, corresponds to generalized synchrony between system and environment. Each sends messages 
that the other can perfectly predict. Uh, now, however, it's clear, and, and I'm not reading anymore, I'm, I'm making a, a quick remark here. I'll continue in a second. In the classical FEP, it's clear that A and B, even if they are, you know, in the perfect limit of the FEP, they remain different, they're, they're different entities, right? Because you have that, if you wish, that extra uh, yeah. layers of differentiation coming from their spatial embedding, right? In the, in the classical FEP, that is clear, that they haven't, even if they are getting synchronized, they have not lost their separate identities. You can always say, well, this is the one that was to the left and this is the one that was to the right. Pun intended with earlier discussion, right? Um, you have that extra uh, resource for, for separating them, if you wish, by virtue of the special embedding, right? The special embedding is giving you this extra information that allows you to keep track of, 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 of A and B separately. Okay, so I'll continue. This notion depends on the system and its environment being separated and has distinguished somehow. In classical formulations, they are separated in ordinary 3D space, i.e. they occupy different locations. So they are different because they occupy different locations, right? But if you don't have that geometrical background, then, then how do you know that they're different, right? Okay, so I continue. The quantum formulation is background free, meaning it assumes no space-time embedding. System and environment do not have different locations, even though they have different sets of degrees of freedom in the overall Hilbert space. Here, the FEP, the limit of the FEP is maximum entanglement. This does not mean that the system and its environment are identical. They aren't, since they have different degrees of freedom. Okay, so this is just addresses the question I, I just posed. It means that the joint state is not separable, okay, um, into a system S and environment T. Their states are no longer conditionally independent. This is distinct from thermal equilibrium, which means that they have the same temperature while remaining separable, uh, and that their interaction can be characterized as the change of thermal fluctuations, i.e. noise. So I, I guess this is a nice warm up for things that are to come. But I, I, I do think that this whole uh, idea of emergent space is going to be um, Possibly, you know, one of one of the most important in the course. And it's going to help bridge the gap between the class and, and the quantum formulations for sure. Dean, what's your take uh, on this? What I what I saw what I saw was that when you have that kind of alignment, that perfect alignment, that is one. That was one. That was D in that dia in that in that uh, diagram, right? That was one state. Of a of a complex state that included an A and a B and a C and probably a whole bunch of other ways that, oh, that was, so, yeah right so that one state where you've got this kind of entanglement isn't isn't into perpetuity like you don't get there and then stay there and that's where I think the the question of separability and complexity it still works because just because you've momentarily gotten to a place that we define here as D doesn't mean you stay there indefinitely. You could be swapping around to B and C and A in the next instant. So that's that at least that holds the complexity piece up that that moment for however long that moment is where X A and X B are aligned isn't permanent. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not predictable in that sense. Therefore, it is complex. I still don't know how we get, though, that the closer we get to agreement, the more complex things are. Unless we're just talking about D in this array of A, B, C, and D. And that goes back to that quantum reference frame. I think, like I said, I, I, again, maybe I'm interpreting this wrong, but when I message pass, the reason why I have to like literally give it over to the other person and let them have it, I can't give them, have them copy what I'm doing, is because there has to be, I guess that reinforces the separability piece of this as well. The fact that I can't give them a copy, that I can only give them the information and then they've got to 
sort of unpack it in their own in their own way of taking it off the the boundary but again uh, i struggle with this i'm i'm guilty as charged but i am i am what i'm trying to do is trying to come up with my own narrative so that what chris is saying makes sense to me as opposed to make sense to the world which is what chris is trying to do i'll try with another speculative fiction so yeah. um there's a screen between let's just say the uh, stage and the audience or whatever it's a holographic screen and on each side of the screen there's some embodied object so that means that it, it must have um vol it's a volume enclosing object because points and lines and planes are only abstractions every real physical object encloses volume and now a light is going to be coming from behind each object facing the screen and that's this kind of uh cone that we're seeing from each side it's like the shadow cast by the object so if the object was a sphere then it would be projecting down to a circle onto the screen if the shape were a cube it could be projecting down and so where the light is positioned is the um perspective that that cognitive entity is taking on its qrf those lights could move so now we have this situation where the two spotlights are moving maybe the shapes are staying the same maybe they're changing too and it's like two searchlights scanning across this b oval and some sometimes they are perfectly locked or i mean there could be a situation where they're perfectly aligned or there could be situations where they're totally disjoint um and each of those situations have different implications for what one entity sees when it looks at the screen maybe like the shadow is the only part where you can see because the rest of it is too blinding or something like that and so then if we're in case a here where um maybe b doesn't have a projection or maybe b's projections totally somewhere else then a is in this solipsistic i'm the active agent interacting with an inert world setting and d is like potentially the um the computer engineer's classical dream or asymptote which is like all the data going through the usb cable is just being perfectly noiselessly received and then we also get these um b and c cases but a is kind of like the inert world d is like the perfect communication channel and then to connect it just to friston's concept of generalized synchrony as we've talked about many times generalized synchrony doesn't mean lockstep two agents could reduce their uncertainty about each other not by doing the same thing at every time step but for example by turn taking and i think that points the way to how we get reduction of variational free energy reduction of prediction error surprise and so on without especially spatial temporal enmeshment but not necessarily even informational identity enmeshment because you could have two things that through their alignment become actually differentiated and that could increase the mutual information between two metronomes not just to have them going in the same direction but to have them going in, in opposite directions the mutual information in those two settings is going to be high so it's not the case that generalized synchrony means that um, things are becoming uh, blurred. We could actually also have integrated information through increased articulation, not just decreased. And then life finds a way or cognition finds a way on this trade-off frontier of in our pursuit of unitarity will we 
blur to unify or will we differentiate to unify but those are the paths we have we don't have the um backwards ratchet sense any other ladder slides ender uh no that's it uh so chris made a few more remarks at the end about uh language here uh but he mentioned that he's gonna talk more about this in the coming lecture so we'll just leave it up to him Yeah, there could be some very powerful and interesting linguistic opportunities for updating our speaking to reflect what we are learning here. I don't know what those necessarily are, whether it's a, a syntactic or a semantic thing, or whether it's a narrative thing, but how to actually re-enter some of these formalisms into our folkish understanding could just be immensely powerful. And um, we could have a, a lot of integrity between the natural language way that potentially we're already showing up for engagement and some of these formalisms that get to first principles about interacting entities and boundary conditions and all of that dean any penultimate thoughts not really i, I i'm going to go back and listen to the i'm going to listen to chris's comments again about this common cause and the fine tuning assumption and whether that's sort of a metaphorically a dialing in or what it what he what he means exactly by the fine tuning in the in the context of this conversation today and what you just kind of said about are we dulling something here or are we sculpting something to make it more fittable like i'm going to go and now and go back and listen to what he talks about in terms of fine tuning and maybe update my priors around that, so. And are any last uh, thoughts or maybe scroll over to the um, schedule of the course again, just so we can close on that. Sure. Yeah, we're, we're halfway through. We just completed the third discussion section now. So we've had three lectures and three discussions. It's all downhill from here. Um, by the way, this was the first midterm. <laughs> you guys both did well. Um, we're going to head into four or like session four with these last three, how agents use multiple communication channels. And that's going to get connected to the quantum FEP, how space time emerges from communication, which is something that we've brought up a bunch. It's been in the background, but, but making that explicit is going to be exciting. And then section six. I think is just going to be such a jumping off point because the scope and the intensity of what is transpiring is extreme. So connecting it to biology, which is to say life more fully and where we go in, in 23 and beyond, that's going to be awesome. So any last words, Andrew? Uh, no, I just echo what you said. Um, very, I would, I would say it's going to be uphill in in terms of how interesting it's going to get. <laughs> uphill in a good sense, meaning that we're climbing. Cool. Well, I encourage people to uh, check out the course website and submit questions that they'd like to see addressed by Chris. Also, to register and join these participatory discussions, there'll be three more of them. So if you want to join, share your QRF, be part of the publication of all of these works that we'll compile at the end and just get your exoskeleton in the game, 
with what is happening here. It'd be really awesome to hear more voices and, and to have more on board. Okay. Thank you, Dean and Andrew. Till next time. Bye-bye.